welcome back to Beginner's Guide to Neural Mechanisms. In part, part four, I'm going to give you an introduction to neurophilosophy. That is where neuroscience meets traditional philosophy and mostly philosophy of mind. Neurophilosophy deals with recalcitrant questions about the mind and brain that seem to be recalcitrant not just because we lack data, but because we don't know what data would be relevant or because there are conceptual commitments that we have to make that we can't determine by the data, or even because the answer is not formulable given the scientific worldview that we currently accept. Dealing with questions in neurophilosophy requires a combination of abstract conceptual thinking and subtle empirical understanding of the brain. Neurophilosophy was really invented by Pat Churchland and elaborated further by Pat and her husband Paul Churchland in a series of books, the primary book being Neurophilosophy, uh, and then extending these ideas of neurophilosophy to include computational models and the way in which they also illuminate the nature of brain function. I'm going to talk to you about some topics in neurophilosophy to give you a sense of what kinds of questions neurophilosophers think about. One of the primary questions is about free will and agency. Free will and agency seem metaphysically problematic because how can mere matter support such phenomena? Especially if, as many scientists think, the world is deterministic. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. The problem of mental causation is also metaphysically problematic. For if the physical world is causally closed, how do mental events cause anything at all? And if they don't cause anything at all, why do we need to make reference to them at all? Maybe they're just epiphenomenal. So how do we explain mental causation in our scientific worldview? Another question is one that we've been discussing so far. So what's the relationship between folk psychology and neuroscience? Is it reductive? Is it eliminativist? Is there no such thing as any of our so folk psychological constructs? And then there's the deep question of consciousness and phenomenal experience. How do we explain subjectivity in objective terms? Is that possible at all? Is there any scientific explanation or even way to measure things like subjective experience or qualia? Other questions include things like meaning and representations, which we've discussed a bit. Um, are there representations in the brain? How do we fix the content of those representations? How can a physical object carry intrinsic rather than derived meaning? Those are questions in neurophilosophy. As well as the nature of morality. Morality is something that we do, but is it real? Is it something that we can discover? Is it something that we construct? Understanding the nature of morality and how our brains compute or process moral questions, moral problems, is another problem that many neurophilosophers think about. And another similar question is the nature of the self. Is there such a thing? What are the processes or components that constitute it, if there is? What is the relation of the self to personal identity? Those are questions that philosophers have thought about for millennia, but they might take on a different uh, look when we incorporate the findings from brain science. So here I'm going to walk you through some recent work in the neuroscience of free will and the way in which it bears on neurophilosophical questions. More than 300 years ago, Spinoza said, men are mistaken in thinking themselves free. Their opinion is made up of consciousness of their own actions and ignorance of the causes by which they're determined. Their idea of freedom, therefore, is simply their ignorance of any cause for their actions. Spinoza thought that men weren't really free, we were all determined, and we only thought we were free because we were under the illusion that we weren't determined. So you might think that science 300 years on could give us a better handle on that question. And in fact, neuroscientists have examined that question. And many, many people think that neuroscience has actually shown us that we lack free will. I want to take a different view. I think there is no experiment thus far that has shown us anything about whether we lack free will. 
But let me take a classic problem that many scientists have thought actually show that we lack free will. The Libet experiment, or a series of experiments post-Libet that take a very similar uh, tack to the problem. So Kornhuber and Dieck discovered a prepar uh, potential in the brain that seemed to be preparatory for volitional movement, what they called the readiness potential. So they asked people to do a simple task, like move a finger or a wrist spontaneously whenever they felt like it. And at the same time, they recorded from their brains, the EEG, so just electrical signals from the scalp. And they time-locked those signals to the point at which the person actually did the movement. So they looked at what happened in these electrical signals at the time of the movement and prior to the time of the movement. So what you see in the center is a bunch of noisy traces of time, the brain signals, EEG signals, prior to their movement, which is at the vertical line. And if you average all those noisy signals together, you get what you see in the lower right, a kind of ramp that starts several uh, hundred milliseconds prior to the movement itself. And this readiness potential is called preparatory activity for volitional movement, or identified as such. And what Libet uh, did was he asked people to, at the same time that they were doing this task, uh, to look at a clock that had a spot moving around on the clock and to tell them when on the, where was the spot at the time when they decided or willed to move their finger or their wrist and looked at the timing rel relative uh, to this ramp of activity that precedes movement. And what they found is that the time at which they identified the time of willing, or W time, was actually about 500 milliseconds before the movement, but several hundred milliseconds after the beginning of the rise of this ramp of activity. And so what Libet interpreted his experiment to show was that the brain decides to will before you are conscious of willing, and that is our consciousness of willing is really epiphenomenal and the brain itself is doing uh, the willing or the choosing before we are. So let me just tell you uh, what the classical view of Libet's results are meant to show or what they assume. First of all, what they assume is that the readiness potential is neural evidence of a decision to move and that follows upon a decision to move that is, the rise from the baseline is the point at which the decision to move has been made. So that's a post-decisional view of the readiness potential. They also assume that the readiness potential is ontologically real. That is, it's a readout of a causally efficacious neural process that leads to action and has a distinct and measurable onset. And finally, they think that the readiness potential is non-conscious because the readiness potential begins before the time at which the person reporting when they're aware of moving reports that time. It precedes the subjective consciousness of decision. So if you believe these three things, this is what leads to the widely accepted doctrine that conscious will is inefficacious. And that is, that we don't freely will, that our brain actually starts the process before we do. But there is an alternative view. Aaron Sugar and colleagues suggested that we could use a standard decision model called a drift to bound or diffusion model or a stochastic accumulator model to model what's going on in these RP experiments. So if you take a standard diffusion to bound or accumulator model, uh, what you postulate is that there's some variable that is evolving over time and if that variable reaches a certain level, crosses a threshold, that's when the decision happens. Now, if you take a bunch of threshold crossings that are indicative of the decisions that lead to movement, and then you average those stochastic excursions to those thresholds and time lock to the threshold crossings, it turns out that what you get is something that looks a lot like the RP. So Sugar showed this by designing a model and what he found is that both looking at the mean waiting time between different trials, 
uh, given his accumulator model, and looking at the shape of the RP that results from that model, uh, both of those elements were well reproduced by the model, um, showing that the data could be accounted for by this accumulator, accumulator model. So while the classic view has the following assumptions, that the uh, RP is post-decisional, that it's ontologically real, and that it's non-conscious, Given the accumulator model, we see that these assumptions are turned on their head. So the revised view is that, in fact, the RP is pre-decisional. That is, the excursion beyond, uh, that goes beyond baseline reflects evidence that contributes to a decision to move, but the decision itself only happens when the variable reaches threshold. Rather than being ontologically real, the RP turns out to be just an artifact of sampling a causally efficacious neural process, which is the decision process, but the underlying signal has no measurable onset and may not resemble the RP at all in individual trials. And finally, while the RP was taken to be non-conscious or the initiation of the RP was non-conscious in the classical view, the alternative view really takes no uh, stance on whether the RP reflects anything about consciousness or not. It may well reflect a signal that gives rise to the subjective experience of decision or intention. So what do we learn from having this alternative interpretation of the Libet's experiments? The standard interpretation of Libet's results claims that our brains decide before we do. But understanding the neuroscience and the modeling of the neuroscience shows that the standard interpretation is almost certainly mistaken. Rather, the RP reflects what we would expect to see given common models of decision processes. And so far, no neuroscience data to date shows that we lack free will. I also want to note that the relevance of this neuroscience data depends on philosophical commitments, for instance, to naturalism, to incompatibilism, to the nature of freedom, et cetera. That is, uh, there's no uh, way to interpret these kinds of results and their relevance to the question of free will without also making commitments about what the importance of determinism or indeterminism is to the possibility of free will. The experiments also raise further questions. For instance, scientific approaches assume that we're just physical systems, but if that's true, then we are a certain kind of mechanism. And how does this notion of mechanism comport with our intuitive notions of free will, or do we actually need to revise those notions? Does determinism matter for free will? Is free will compatible with indeterminism? In fact, you might think that while many people think that indeterminism is necessary for free will, if indeterminism is randomness, and you postulate that our decisions are predicated on indeterminism, then how can randomness underlie a notion of free will that we're comfortable with? And furthermore, there's the question of the relationship between consciousness and freedom. So the Libet experiments put the uh, time of subjective experience or consciousness of willing as primary for the possibility of free will. But that doesn't seem to be something that we should automatically accept. So there are lots more questions to explore in this area and with all areas of neurophilosophy. Thank you for watching The Beginner's Guide to Neural Mechanisms.